So let's go ahead and pray over the ministry of the Word in this place, and then we'll get into what we have to share this morning. So glad to see all of you. Father, we come now to the point in the service where we always, very deliberately and intentionally, regardless of what the world is doing or saying around us, we proclaim the Word of God. Your Word is eternal. Not one word of it will fall. It is everlasting. You've given it to us so that anybody that will read it and obey it and follow it can have the light of life within them. Can they know you? They can draw close to you as Lord and Savior. And so as we open up your word in this place today, Lord, I don't rely upon the cleverness of my speech to change hearts. I don't have the ability to to change anybody that's watching the live stream or sitting in this room today. I have no ability to change anybody. But when your Holy Spirit begins to probe and prod and speak, you have the ability to get people's attention and to push them off their their places of comfort and to cause their eyes to look into your eyes one more time and to hear what you're saying. And you give them that strong possibility to follow and to obey. You don't force them, of course, but you give them that opportunity to do that one more time. So we give you this um, time of preaching the word in this place, and I pray that you might do way more than I even have hoped this week, than I even expected this week. And we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Even as I prayed, I, I got this sudden memory of a few days ago when we were with some of our family and grandkids and whatnot, and, and one of the little grandsons had been being a bit disobedient, not playing nicely with other kids. And so his daddy sat him on his lap, and he's trying to talk to him. And the kid's eyes are everywhere except in his dad's eyes. And daddy kept saying, look me in the eye. And the kid would look everywhere, look me in the eye. Because dad was trying to actually get, try to get to the truth of something that had happened. And so I'm just asking you this morning to look into the eyes of Jesus as we preach this morning. Please don't take lightly what goes on during this preaching time. Don't be distracted by your cell phones or anything else, but look into the eyes of Jesus. You don't have to look into my eyes, but look into the eyes of the Lord today and hear what he would say to you. Can I hear an amen to that, please? Okay, thank you. Um, Having mentioned cell phones, I thought it was only appropriate that I had my cell phone out and on the pulpit this morning, ready to go, because it, it hasn't been working all that great lately. I've had it for roughly two years. It actually, this is not important, but it broke like right at the beginning of the start of COVID when everything was locked down. And everything in my life is on my cell phone, everything. And so you feel like you can't literally go two hours without it working. And somehow in the midst of COVID and all the stores being locked down, I, I had to get a new phone in the middle of that. So it's coming up on about two years now, but I've just noticed the past couple months that it's not running as fast or well as it did just two years ago. Certain apps that I use are kind of jumpy instead of operating fast and smooth like they should. And of course, the battery seems to drain a little bit faster than it did two years ago. And I've, I've tried to ignore it for a while and just kind of, you know, well, maybe it'll go away, maybe it'll fix itself. But and after a while, you reach that point of frustration. You know, okay, I got to deal with this. I have to address it. And you probably know what to do if you have a smartphone. The first thing you got to do is see, well, what kind of apps do I have open? What's running in the background that's taking up a lot of memory and draining the battery? So I just thought I'd check my apps today with you and, and, and close them. So I got one here of, I don't know, oh, that's Amazon. I'll close that. I got one showing the, the camera feeds for the church right now. I, I can close that one. The next one is one showing all the thermostats in the church. Let's me control everything remotely. Next one is just a normal text message app. Next one is some more camera feeds. Next one is the house camera feed, a lot of camera feeds on here. Next one's a, I don't know what that is, a blank screen, we'll close that one. Here's Facebook, imagine that, with my childhood friend Stan, sitting in front of his fireplace this morning, talking about how cold it was in Texas. So I had to write back and tell him, well, 
we got your beat because we're about eight degrees colder and we have five inches of snow. Um, then there's a Facebook Messenger is open. Um, then the contacts. Then alarms. Um, remind me, I need to get a haircut today. Um, Google search, Netflix. <laughs> I don't know who's been playing solitaire on my phone, but it seems to be open. Close that. Another Google window. Waze app. My goodness, one of those things is running slowly lately. Um, a, oh, 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 good. A Bible app. I was hoping, doing this in front of everybody, there'd be a Bible app open on my phone. Um, weather. 17 degrees, according to this, in Waukegan. Um, another blank screen. Oh, this is a good one here. This is, a, this is my favorite. Anybody know what that is? I'm not going to show it to you really close. What? I can hear it. Steps? Good guess. No. Try wait. Every morning I wait myself with the same exact scenario if you want to picture what that is. So I'm accurate and I record it every single day for the last three years. Really. I probably missed once or twice in three years because I'm kind of obsessive. Another white screen. That, <laughs> I'm not telling you what that is. Um, Anybody ever heard of Babylon B? I don't know how that got open. Um, that, Join Neighbors, whatever that is. App Store, Verizon, the camera screen, photo. My goodness, no wonder this thing's running slow. Oh, this is an email for somebody I work for. That comes up on my phone. Um, Dropbox, I don't know what that is either. Um, oh, huh, I'm not going to tell you what that is. Um, and another, another, somebody's been playing solitaire on my phone. I don't know who it is. Well, so we got rid of all those apps, so I'm guessing it's going to run on faster. But just for good measure, a little bit later, I'll shut down the power and restart it and give it a nice reboot. And then it will be like a fresh new phone. It'll have the memory back and the battery power back to run just like it did two years ago. Well, we just closed out the year 2021, and we are one and a half days into the new year, and my pastoral heart towards you today, right from Pastor George's heart to yours, is that we would stop, assess, and make some changes instead of just keeping going like we always do. It's always a good idea to stop once in a while and really take an inventory of our lives. Now, I wasn't planning on preaching this today. I had something else all set that I've been planning for months that I'm planning to do next week instead that some of you are expecting because you know it's coming. Karen, you might know what I'm talking about because you and I talked about it. Um, but this past week, I just, just knew I wasn't supposed to share that today. I was supposed to share something along the lines of what I'm going to share. And so I'm trusting the Holy Spirit is leading that because he has a way of doing that. There might just be, just like my phone a few minutes ago, a whole lot of stuff running in the background of your life. Lots of activity, lots of stuff, all taking up your time, all taking up your energy, so the things that are really important are getting shortchanged. And there's not a lot left to service the things that are really important because of all the things that are running in the background. And it's a great time to stop and assess and delete a lot of those things running in the background, just like I did with my apps a few minutes ago. It's a good time to do a general reset, a reboot, a good overall house cleaning. And a few of you were doing this this week at your houses. Beth and I, she wrote me into it. Did I say that? To do, you know, taking all the books off, all the bookcases, and every pastor a lot of books, so we can clean behind and vacuum the tops of the books. And somehow I got roped into this because I am a really sweet, wonderful husband. And some of you have been probably doing some house. Something about this time of year, you want to clean something. Instead of just keep them going... It's a good time to do some good general house cleaning so that our focus and our energy are on the things that really matter instead of being distracted with all kinds of busyness and frivolousness. Did I say that? And sometimes we are grieving the Holy Spirit without ever even realizing it. 
as I was trying to think, well, Lord, I know what I want to say this Sunday, but, but scripturally, where do we find it? Where can I, because I like my sermons obviously to be scriptural, not just some, you know, good ideas. And I felt like he led me to the passage about grieving the Holy Spirit. And the key passage where you find that terminology is in Ephesians chapter 4, um, at verse 32. It says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And I want you to remember, as we talk about grieving the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is a person. It's a he. Although I shouldn't say it, because he's not a it. The Holy Spirit is a person. And so when you grieve the Holy Spirit, you are grieving a person, one of the three persons in the Holy Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force, as some would make him out to be, but he is, in every sense of the word, a person. And he can be grieved, just like our own children, if we have children, sometimes grieve us. And now that we are grandparents, there have been times when our little grandkids, as little as they are, have grieved us because we've seen things in their characters that are nasty. They're not nice. They're not pleasant. You think, wow, what happened to that sweet little grandchild? How could they just blurt out what they just blurted out? To be honest, sometimes you, the people who I love the most outside my own immediate family, you grieve me. When I know that you're living below where you could be, when I know that it doesn't appear anyway that Jesus is really absolutely number one in your life, but he just kind of falls somewhere down the line where it's convenient, I, I feel grieved. I feel grieved. And right here, as I say that, it should be obvious, and I want to stress this this morning, that the only ones who we can grieve are the people who truly and sincerely love us. So if, if God is grieved because of, of how we're living, it's because he truly loves us. If your pastor is grieved because I sense you're, you're living below where you could be, it's because I, I really, really love you. If your parent is grieved at your behavior, it's because they really love you. And, and it's only people who love you who can ever be really grieved at how you are living. Therefore, when we are grieving the Holy Spirit, we are making the one who loves us most of all in the entire universe very sad. He doesn't hate us. He doesn't want to see us punished and get retribution. But he knows how much better we could be living. He knows how much healthier we could be living. And he wants to see us draw near to God, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in his grief, he is hoping that we will come to our senses and make deliberate changes and come back to our first love. Like when David, King David, sinned against God by committing an indecent act with a married woman. He came to his senses He knew God was grieved, and he actually became grieved because he had grieved God. But he came back to his first love. Like when Paul and Barnabas had a serious falling out. It wasn't a minor disagreement. It was a serious falling out over John Mark and what to do about John Mark, such that Paul and Barnabas went their separate ways for a while. But their inability to get along was grieving God. It ultimately grieved Paul and Barnabas, and they reconciled again, which is what always should happen. Like when the Israelites grew cold towards the Lord time and time again, God was grieved because he missed the close fellowship that he had with his chosen people. So what are some of the ways that we can grieve the Holy Spirit? Maybe some ways come to your minds already. 
Maybe the Holy Spirit is even speaking things to you as I talk this morning. But I'll throw out a few ways. This is not exhaustive. Um, The first way that comes to my mind is having our minds and mouths tainted with foulness or uncleanness. And you think, what are you talking about, Pastor George? Well, I was with a family recently who started watching an old Christmas children's classic with their children. And it's a rather innocuous one at that. I mean, it's just, I consider it a very innocuous kind of movie. But within a few minutes, the children's classic got a little more violent than the parents deemed age appropriate for their children. And so they stopped the movie, much to the very vocal chagrin of one of their children. And the mom then very carefully and wisely explained to the child that whatever we take into our minds never goes away. And then she said, we can never get rid of those images. Whatever images you and I put in our heads, we can never get rid of them. Even if we want to get rid of them, they're there, they are indelible. And then she reminded her children, and again, she was just so wise, I so respected listening to her, that the Bible says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever we put in our minds travels down to our hearts, and then, according to God's word, and it's as true as can be, it begins to come out of our mouths. Out of the overflow of our hearts, our mouths speak. I was so impressed listening to this mother, and I found myself thinking that I could never have done the good job that she did. What I would have done is said, we're not going to watch it and stopped it, and that would have been it. There wouldn't have been any careful biblical explanation like she so masterfully did. Well, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we take into our minds things that ought not to be there. We begin to allow things in our lives that we never used to allow. We would have said no to, and yet we begin to say, well, you know, whatever, I need some entertainment tonight. It can't be that bad. Uh... I, I, just, I just need a break. I just need, I just need. And so we allow ourselves something that we used to say no to, but we take it into our minds. It travels through our hearts. And at some point, it will come out in our language. I don't know if you've ever noticed that personally. I have. I really have. When I've been allowing my mind to go places it shouldn't go. I just noticed that inadvertently, unintentionally, things come out of here. When I'm talking to my wife or something, I think, whoa, man. Because you can't keep it hidden. Because what goes in here goes down here, and just like the Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You never find anything more true, by the way, than this book right here. Now, people will say, well, I just, want to keep, I just want to keep it real. And I've even heard pastors say really coarse things from the pulpit and justify, well, I just want to keep it real. I want to keep it authentic. And I would say, why not keep it real godly? Is there shame in keeping it real godly? Is there shame in keeping our homes godly? Is there shame in being very careful what we take into our hearts and minds? Is there shame in keeping it godly? I think not. God says in the book of Ephesians through Paul, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So that's one thing that can grieve the Holy Spirit, allowing foulness and uncleanness into our hearts and minds. A second thing that comes to my mind, and this is actually in that passage that mentions grieving the Holy Spirit in Ephesians, bitterness. Bitterness grieves the Holy Spirit, making him sad, making him sorrowful. The definition of bitterness is an embittered and resentful spirit that refuses to be reconciled. What place does bitterness have in our hearts? Why let more time 
go by before we are reconciled. And if the person that we had the problem with is already dead or they're gone, they're far away, we don't know where they are, we can still forgive them before God. We can still get our hearts right again instead of holding on to that unforgiveness. In the parable of the unmerciful servant that Jesus told, a servant owed the king 10,000 talents, which is equivalent to 20 years of wages. And the servant couldn't pay. And the king said, I'm tired of of waiting, and so I'm going to order that you be sold along with your children, along with your wife, and you're going to go pay, make sure this debt is, is paid. And the servant, when he heard that he was going to be sold along with his family, he gets on his knees and he starts begging and imploring the king to have mercy on him, not to sell him, please forgive the debt. And out of pity, the king relented and he showed him mercy and he forgave the entire debt. But as soon as that servant who was forgiven went out from the king's presence, he finds a man who owes him some money. He finds a man who owes him only 100 denarii, which is equivalent to one day's of wage. And he seizes him, and he chokes him, and he demands payment. And that servant begged for mercy, but the servant who had been forgiven wouldn't show him any, and instead had him put into a debtor's prison. And Jesus concluded that peril by saying, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, why does it grieve the Holy Spirit so much when we are holding some unforgiveness towards somebody, when we have a bitterness in our hearts towards somebody? It's very simple. It's because we have been forgiven far, 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 far more then we are ever asked to forgive someone else. That's what that parable of the unmerciful servant teaches. If you've come to a place where you really know your condition outside of Christ, you know how much it took to forgive you. It took the precious blood of the very Son of God dying on a cross. And so whatever However, you have to forgive someone who has wronged you. It is always far, far less compared to what your God had to do, the lengths he had to go to, to forgive you. And that's why God gets so grieved when we refuse to forgive. Because he's forgiven us the 20 years wages compared to the one days of wages that we're holding against someone else. That's why it grieves him so much. Don't let bitterness stay in your life. I had a situation about five years ago with somebody that we just had a severe falling out. Um, I'm not somebody that gets really angry or raises my voice a lot, but I got really angry and I raised my voice a lot. (laughs) And they did too. It was a brother in the Lord. And we kind of went our separate ways, but it bothered me. I didn't run into him at all, but it just bothered me. And I couldn't get it out of my mind for about three years. And I finally said, Lord, you got to do something. You got to let me run into this person again because I want to ask his forgiveness. And thankfully, I mean, God loves to answer those kind of prayers, by the way. God let me run into him. And so I just out and out said, would you please forgive me? I said, I really lost my temper that day. And I said things I should never have said. And, and you didn't deserve them. And, and so he forgave me. And then he said, as you might imagine, would you forgive me too? And he did. But, but it was so good to get it off my chest and not to just let it stay there forever. We also grieve the Holy Spirit when we are just angry people. Angry people don't just lash out with with sudden tirades. 
angry people always end up slandering others. Slander is speaking evil of people behind their backs. We've all been hurt in life. Every one of us has been hurt time and time again, and you'll be hurt a lot more times um, until you, you die. But we have a choice as to how we're going to react. Like Shylock in Shakespeare is the Merchant of Venice, we can demand our pound of flesh and stay angry and deserve retribution or repayment from that person, or we can commit it all to God who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And we can let go of the anger and not hold on to the anger that we hold towards people or in general. Some people are just angry people in general, aren't they? They're just angry all the time. I know some of them. Some of them go to my church. You think I don't know. But it doesn't take a whole lot to pick up on who the angry people are. And you just kind of learn after a while. There's, there's little, little giveaways that let you know. And as I, as I said a few minutes ago, anger, just being an angry person, always leads to slandering people. People unrelated to why we're angry. We just slander people. We find fault with people. We're mad at people. I ran across something this week. I, I thought I'd heard it all from St. Augustine, but I guess I haven't. It said, it said that St. Augustine had a sign on his wall um, by his dining table that said, he who speaks evil of an absent man or woman is not welcome at this table. Isn't that a sign? Somebody ought to needlepoint that for me, Okay. Uh, Kay, is Kay here? Kay, you ought to needlepoint that for me, okay? He who speaks evil of an absent man or woman is not welcome at this table. One of the prayers that God will answer the quickest, I kid you not, I promise you, is when you say, Lord, I really want to take to heart what Pastor George said this morning, and I want you to convict me before I speak evil of someone. I don't know why. God will answer that prayer so instantaneously. You can pray for a physical healing and wait for it. You can pray for a provision, a blessing, and wait for it and wonder why God's taken so long. But if you say, Lord, I want you to begin to convict me before I speak evil of someone, he answers those prayers instantaneously. If you do that on your way home to church today, you won't get through dinner, if you're not eating alone anyway, before you'll start to say something and suddenly you oh, I really shouldn't say that because I don't need to say that. That's, that's, that's not nice. That's an angry statement. It's malicious. It's malice. It's slander. God loves to answer those kinds of prayers. And I really mean it. He will answer them faster than any other prayers you ever, ever pray. He sure does in my life. And I find it immensely inconvenient sometimes. It's like, but Lord, that was the perfect pithy thing to say. And I had this choice before me. I could not say it and miss that chance to just say the perfect thing, the perfect comeback. Or I can, well, I'll disobey this time. Maybe, maybe you can convict me the next time. You know what I mean? I think you do. I hope you do. Another way of grieving the Holy Spirit is with, and you knew I was going to come back to this because of the whole smartphone apps, over busyness. Over busyness. Over busyness is a huge enemy of healthy living. I liken it to having too many apps open on your phone, too much stimulus always vying for part of you. You know the apps that, that have notifications. And, you know, I, I have most of them turned off, a few turned on. But, you know, I we were driving to church this morning and suddenly there's something coming up. And I told Bill, oh, that's a Facebook message. Just, but it, you might have your weather app given to you. You might have ways telling you there's a roadblock up ahead. You might have Facebook message, normal messages, emails. Um, news breaks from Fox News or something. It's endless if you have all those notifications turned on. And it's, it's 
it's similar to life in general. You have too much going on. Something's always vying for your attention because you're just plain too busy. One of the huge robbers of time and energy, and this is just one example out of you know, hundreds I guess I gotta give, but social media. Social media is a huge robber of time and energy. That's why some people, and I know some of these people, refuse to have a social media presence. They do not have a Facebook account because they know that it just robs them of time and energy, and so they, they have the courageous stance of, I just won't have a Facebook account, and maybe my life will go on. And others, and you've, you've seen people like this too, I have, will announce on Facebook that this is taking up too much of my time and energy, so I'm taking a break from Facebook. You're not going to see me here for two months or something. And I've noticed, maybe you have too, that usually less than a week, they're, they're sliding back on. You notice that, Rosa? They're slipping back on. They're there. Sli- and I think, hmm, I would never say anything, but I'm thinking, you couldn't go a month. You couldn't go two months. You couldn't go a few days before just, why? It, it's an addiction. That's, what, that's how addictions are. It doesn't matter if it's an addiction to alcohol or drugs or gambling or Facebook. That's how addictions are. You think, well, I, I, can, I don't need this. So I'm going to take a break. No, you can't if you're addicted to it. Now, not everybody's addicted to it, of course. Some people use it and they control it, and it has a lot of good purposes. But some of us would do very well to throttle back our usage of social media. You know the story, I hope, if you know, I'm going to tell you, of Jesus visiting the home of Mary and Martha. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now, what I think is especially fascinating about this story, if you've never thought about this before, over-busyness is not just a sickness of our modern age. It's a symptom of our fallen condition. Martha had no internet. She had no cell phone. She had no Facebook. She had no cable TV. She had no landline. As far as I know, she didn't have a 10,000-square-foot house on six acres that she was responsible for, for caring for. But she thrived, nevertheless, on busyness, being way too busy. And according to God's Word, she was distracted by all of her busyness. And clearly, it took her away from time with Jesus when he was personally in her living room. Think about that. You know, we think we we just wish Jesus would come and pay us a visit, but he'd sit down. Well, some of us, even if he did, (laughs) we wouldn't sit with him. We'd go back in the house, we'd go make some food, we'd make another pot of coffee, we'd answer the phone, because it's a symptom of our fallen condition. Jesus called Martha on it, and I would call us on it and challenge us today. Busyness is being way too occupied with things that are not intrinsically bad, but they just drain too much of our resources. And consequently, they make us unavailable to Jesus. He's trying to get our attention to ask us to do something, to serve somebody in some way. We never even hear it. We don't have time to hear it. We're too busy. Oh, we, over business makes us deaf to his voice. We don't, we don't hear it. We're unaware. We wonder why he's not speaking to us. He is speaking to us. We can't hear. We're just plain too busy. As we've sometimes said, and I always get, I always get a lot of people commenting on this, why, probably, probably why I'd say it again, but God doesn't have different levels of membership in his universal 
church. We can't choose to go with just the bronze membership or the copper membership and let somebody else go all the way to the silver and the gold. Jesus only has one kind of membership in his church. And it's described by himself when he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. There is only one kind of membership in the Lord's church. And it's the kind where Jesus Christ is first. He's Lord of all. He doesn't fall down the line somewhere. He doesn't fall when we finally have some time for him. But he only accepts first place or no place. The way to test this, to see if we have that kind of walk with him, is to see how we react when he asks us to lay something down, when he asks us to give up something. We all have things that are very near and dear to us. We have things that we wouldn't care if we had to give them up, but we have things that really mean the world to us. And when all of a sudden he asks us to lay one down or he takes one away, that's when we find out if he really is Lord of all. If he really does matter to us more than anything else in all, all the world. I know I've told you this a little bit too many times, but I can't help it. But I just think of the, the morning that we got the news that my brother died suddenly and unexpectedly. And we were called down to the hospital in Skokie. Beth and I went down there to, to see his body while I was still in the, the hospital room. And before God, I can tell you, there was no anger in my heart. I wasn't mad at God or upset. My only brother, my only sibling in this area, our only family in this area, I wasn't upset at all, not even a little bit. I was sad. I mean, I was crying. My brother's gone. My only brother, we shared a bedroom for 23 years of my life growing up. And he's gone. He's dead, unexpectedly. All we could do, really do is thank the Lord for the life that my brother lived. And for the, we, he was in our life. And that's how it is when, when Jesus is first. When God takes something away or asks you to give up something that you're holding like this. If you can say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. Then you know he really is first and foremost. And that's really the only place we want to be. Because you can't choose the copper membership. You can't say, well, I'll go with the silver. Pastor George, if you want to shoot for the gold, go ahead, but I'm happy. Jesus only has one kind of membership in his universal church. Can I hear an amen to that? Remember the old gospel song, All to Jesus I Surrender, All to Thee I Freely Give. The Holy Spirit was grieved, back to that grief again, with the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. Well, what kind of church were they? The fact is, if you and I were called to evaluate them, we'd say, man, that is a great church. You might say, I wish Family Life Church was more like that. Well, what were they like? Well, we're told in the book of Revelation, they were hard workers and they persevered. We're told they didn't tolerate wickedness, and they didn't tolerate false teachers. We're told that they endured hardship for Jesus' name. So it was a great church. It was fantastic. And yet, Jesus wasn't happy with them. He was grieved over the church. And why was he grieved? We're told they had forsaken their first love. He wasn't satisfied with all the hard work and perseverance and maintaining good doctrine and all the rest. They had left their first love. They no longer loved him the way they did at first. And he told them to repent and get back to loving him 
supremely. A lot of you in our church are good housekeepers. You don't like clutter. Even on a bad day, your house is clean and it's presentable and it it's, can be downright remar remarkable. And some of you don't have any trouble throwing away or giving away good stuff because you just say, well, it's cluttering my life. I don't need it. And you very freely divest yourself of things that are still working. They're so good. They're, they're still nice. Other people would love to have them. But you realize you just don't need them. You want to declutter your life of even good stuff. That's what I am asking you to do at the outset of the year 2022. Do a good house cleaning. I don't mean your bookcase at home. I'm talking your heart case right here. If you find there's some bitterness there, somebody that you're holding something against. One way you know when you're holding something against somebody is it just keeps coming back to your mind. You can't, it's just always there because it's part of who you are. Lay down your bitterness. Lay down your unforgiveness. Remind yourself that Jesus forgave 20,000 times whatever little bit that person did to you. So who are you to not forgive them when Christ Jesus has forgiven you an infinite amount? You can even look at your, your tangible life. Do you need all of the stuff? Do you need all of the possessions? We live in a culture of stuff. You don't even have to have money to have a lot of stuff. It's almost like it, it, it um, multiplies overnight. You can go from a brand new apartment that's empty. A year later, it's full. It's just, it's just it's, that's the kind of culture we live in. It's not that you're rich. It's just we get stuff. Do you really need all that stuff? Do you really need all the possessions? Maybe you can take the courageous act of saying, I'm just going to clear out a lot. I'm going to simplify my life. Do you need all the activities that use up your time? Now, I might really step on some toes here. I'm not trying to. But you see it a lot with young families where they over-program their little kids. You know, the child's five years old, and every day they're going to school from school to another activity, another activity, and the poor kid, and Saturday comes, they're off to more activities, and it's like a grief. Is that really healthy for your five-year child, year old child, or your 12-year-old child? Is that really healthy to have every minute program with some other great activity that is somehow is supposed to give them a more fun life, a better life, and make them more successful? I don't think it is. And I'm not trying to step on toes, but I think it's better to even raise your children to live more simply and to be healthier and to be happier in their families instead of trying to do everything all the time. Do you need all the activities that are using up all your time? Or could you actually make some courageous decisions and say, I'm going to shave some off. I don't need to be doing all the stuff that I'm doing. Would you have greater peace if you reprioritized your life? Would you be more at rest if you simplified a bit? Wouldn't you feel less conflicted? That's a great word to use here inside. If you know or knew that you're repositioning Jesus to be number one. That there have been other things in the way, and you're repositioning him to be number one. Wouldn't you be less conflicted? Because all of us have conflict inside. Call it conviction, conflict, lack of peace. When we are kind of ignoring what we really know, you know, we're being the Marthas. Busy, 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 and yet we never have time for, for he who is most important. And I'm suggesting, I'm saying, I'm preaching We'd be less conflicted if we know that we have put Jesus number one in our life. He is the first love. I would love for all of us to, to take a stock of our lives. I grew up in a, 
home in Baltimore, as many of you know. What you don't know is that my grandfather, Jones, he, for years and years, operated a variety store on Greenmount Avenue in Baltimore. And it was just a small neighborhood variety store, um, popular in the days before they started building the strip malls, you know, where people would go down the street to the mall. Um, it was just a variety store. He sold everything from greeting cards to batteries to pipe fittings to paint to candy to pop to personal hygiene items. I mean, you name it, he sold it in his variety store. And every year, at the very beginning of January, I don't know if it's between Christmas and New Year's or January 1st, we, the kids in the family, the grandkids, would go to the store and take inventory. And we had these clipboards, it was all manual, no computers, no scanners, all manual. And we'd have to list every single item in the store, everything, and put down there are 10 of that kind of candy bar. There's three cases of Coke. There's 16 male pipe fittings. They're just, just everything in the store had to be itemized, and somehow you know, it comes into the play with the, the taxes and all that. It would be a great idea if we would take inventory of our lives at the beginning of this new year that God has given us. And the best way to do it, in fact, probably the only way to do it, is privately, just us and God. Just the two of us, us and him. And don't rush it. Take time and say, Lord, it's time to do inventory. And I'll sit quietly while you show me my life and show me the things that really should be different. And show me how I have taken you off the throne and made you number two or three or four or number 300. And I want to put you back in the first place. He asked me to walk through your life and show you the things that you would do well to change. Ask him if there's areas where you're grieving him. We all we, 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 we build scar tissue. We put scar tissue over areas where we grieve the Lord. So we, we're a little bit harder to hear his voice. We don't get convicted as much because we're, we're close to it. But let him walk through and, and point out things that perhaps we'd rather him not. <clears throat> Ask him where we are troubling him, where we are living below where we really could be living in our relationship with him. Ask him to show us where a distance has formed between us and him, where we no longer have the same white hot devotion to him that we did when we first knew our sins are forgiven. Maybe we have some bad habits. They've just gotten started and they become part of us. And we don't even question them anymore. We give the Lord a chance to say, you know, there's a few things, a few habits you have that don't need to be in your life. And you can change them. Take stock of what you're letting into your heart. What you're looking at. You know, whether it's Facebook, the internet, cable TV, Netflix, whatever. Whatever. Take stock of what am I letting into my mind that's going into my heart that is coming out in my speech. And don't be afraid to make changes. Is it easy to make changes? No, it's hard. You're going against the tide. You're going against what everybody else is doing. Even a lot of times your Christian brothers and sisters won't really understand or really support you because when you start making changes, they're starting to feel convicted. So they'll say, well, don't overdo it now, Karen. You don't want to be too, you know, you're going overboard, Karen. Is there really a shame in going overboard for Jesus? I don't think there can be. But, but we all hear those things. Well, you don't want to go, I don't be a fanatic. I don't want to be a fanatic about this. I want to, I want to be real. I want to be authentic. Well, why not be really godly? Don't be afraid to make changes. I know some people, I'll say a handful of people that I think live very differently than most Christians, and including myself. And I think I see very specific steps they take, and their life really does look different than a lot of other believers. But I think I admire them for that, because they don't have to give in to peer pressure. 
They don't have to have what everybody else has. They don't have to do things the way everybody else does them. They have the courage to say, our family is going to make some different decisions. We're not asking other people to like it or dislike it, but it's our family, and we're going to make these decisions. So don't be afraid to make changes. So that's what I'm asking you to do at the outset of this year. Um, to sum it all up, get back to your first love. And I don't mean your girlfriend from college, okay? <laughs> get back <laughs> to putting <laughs> Jesus at the very first place in your life. Don't just fit him in somewhere. Don't just throw him some crumbs if there's some left. Are you a courageous person? Do you consider yourself courageous? It takes courage to shut down a lot of the apps in the background. It takes courage to stop some of the endless activities that are every day sapping your strength and sapping your resources. Quietly, probably ask God the Holy Spirit to show you where you are grieving him. Be willing to say no to things that everybody else says yes to just because you feel like the Lord's asking you to, calling you to, and you'll be more at peace. Simplify your life. Lots of people won't understand. But so what? I suspect that we all might have more peace in our lives if we just simplified. That's why Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We really can't put a price tag on our souls being at rest. Amen.